first and foremost, I'd like to thank all of our wonderful speakers for uh, participating today. We appreciate your participation in this and your in providing your commentary on this important topic um, in our last event before our annual conference. So we appreciate we appreciate you uh, coming to today and speaking with us. I also would like to recognize our wonderful worker co-chairs for helping us put this event together. Uh, we can, what we would not be able to do what we do without them. Um, so I'd like to thank Laura Ho uh, and Stephanie Vasquez, who are the health and nutrition work group co-chairs, and Matthew Bremen and uh, Christy Olenek for the health, uh, sorry, for the youth and development work group. So we appreciate, we appreciate everything they do to help make these events possible. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time because we know, I know we have a packed schedule and I'll get uh, to uh, having Laura doing her introduction in a moment. But I want to just plug our annual conference, which is coming up in, believe it or not, three weeks time. So if you have not signed up, uh, registration is now open on our website. So please feel free to look there for everything concerning the conference from our agenda to uh, sponsors, you know, as I said, purchasing tickets, anything, anything conference related is on our website now. So feel free to check that out. We, we, it will be, it's looking, it's shaping up to be a really great day with a lot of some pretty big name speakers. So check that out. Um, and the only thing I'll mention with regards to the event, this will be like any of our other events that we've done during the pandemic. But the one thing I'll just point out is please don't be shy to send questions throughout the course of the event. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the entire event. So if you have a question at any point in time, feel free to drop it in there and we will address the question at the towards the end of the event. We have some time for audience Q&A at the end. And with that, I will hand it over to Laura who will provide the context for today's event. Hi, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm Laura Ho. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives of the International Rescue Committee. And along with my co-chair for the Health and Nutrition Work Group, Stephanie Vasquez, uh, We've been working with Matthew Bremen and Christy Olenek from who are the co-chairs of the Youth and Development Work Group. And we're really excited about this event, which will be highlighting some great youth advocates for family planning. Uh, I really wanted to get to them speaking, so I'm not gonna really take up too much more time. I will mention I will be stepping down as co-chair. So if you're interested in getting involved um, in SID and the Health and Nutrition Work Group, uh, we will be recruiting someone soon. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shailen, who's going to be moderating our session today. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And it's really great to be here. My name is Shailen Stanley. I work at Pathfinder International as our next generation engagement officer. So it's a really fun way for me to connect with young leaders and change makers like the panelists that we have in today's conversation to talk more and find new ways that this next generation or Gen Z and millennials are really able to engage with the issues that they care about, about and gain the skills and information that they need to then be really informed and empowered activists and change makers. So it was really wonderful to be here today with our three panelists and hear more about their story as it relates to sexual and reproductive health and how they're involved. But before we jump into them, I'm also really excited to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Rowley to share more background about the challenges that young people face related to their sexual and reproductive health and how more on how we can address what's often such a taboo topic and really ensure that we're having the conversations that we need to have around this, um, this issue. Elizabeth has over 20 years of public health research and program experience around the world. She's currently past global advisor for gender programs and research, where she leads capacity building and gender integra integration across um, CAF programs. But with that, I'll hand it over to you, Elizabeth, um, to do our opening. Thanks so much. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited to hear um, from the speakers. And so I'm um, just going to, in the next few minutes, provide some data points around adolescent and youth uh, sexual and reproductive health, focusing on issues related to family planning um, as a framing for the rest of the discussion that will hopefully be helpful. Um, and um, you know, just two overarching points to start off with. First, um, in many ways, I think the numbers speak for themselves. Um, the sexual and reproductive rights of youth in many low and middle income countries 
are not being met. Um, and this has serious consequences for youth today and in the years to come at both the individual and collective levels. Um, and second, a caveat simply that, um, as we know, youth are diverse and the experiences and needs of youth um, vary based on geographic and socioeconomic context, age groups, marital status, ethnicity, gender identity and expression, mental health status, disability status, and many other factors. Um, some of the data cover diversity and experiences and needs and some do not, and there are a number of data gaps. So um, I think um, to frame discussions, um, it's helpful to take a look at some of the overall trends in adolescent pregnancy. Um, you, the UN estimates that the global adolescent birth rate, which is the annual number of births to adolescent females aged 15 to 19 per 1,000 adolescents in that age group, has decreased since the early 1990s globally. Um, the global adolescent pregnancy rate for 2019 was estimated at 42.5 births per 1,000 um, adolescents aged 15 to 19. Um, and that downward trend has been driven in part by a steep decline by about 72.5% in Central and Southern Asia um, from 95.3 to 26.2 per thousand since the early 1990s. Um, adolescent birth rates in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean remain the highest worldwide at 104 and 63 births per um, thousand adolescent girls, respectively. Um, within Africa, there's considerable variation across countries. And if you look at national data, one typically sees um, subnational differences as well. Um, and this is evident in the map um, with the um, different colored countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, data also indicate that a large proportion of births to adolescents are unintended, uh, meaning pregnancies that are reported to have been either I want unwanted, um, they occurred when no children, they occurred when no children or no more children were desired or mistimed. They occurred earlier than desired. Um, next slide, please. So taking a closer look at factors uh, related to unintended pregnancy among adolescents in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in 2018, uh, Ibrahim Yaukubu and Waliu Jawula Salisu published a systematic review of both quantitative and qualitative studies addressing factors associated with unintended pregnancy among adolescent females in Sub-Saharan Africa. And based on their review of the research literature, they identified key determinants um, for unintended adolescent pregnancies in three main groupings. First, uh, socio-cultural, environmental, and economic factors. Second, uh, health service related factors. And third, individual later and individual level factors, um, as you can see in the slide. So I think we're gonna hear much more um, about some of these factors from today's speakers, um, which are definitely not restricted to the Sub-Saharan Africa um, context. These are also critical barriers to youth access to family planning information and services, and by extension, barriers to their rights in South Asia, the Caribbean, and other geographies as well. Uh, next slide, please. So globally, the modern contraceptive prevalence rate for adolescent females, which is defined as the percentage of adolescents uh, age 15 to 19 years, married or in union, who are currently using or whose sexual partner is using at least one modern method of contraception, has doubled between 2009 and 2019 and currently stands at 21%. Um, again, there are big regional differences, 57% uh, uh, contraceptive, modern contraceptive prevalence rate for adolescent females in Latin America and 15% in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, it's also helpful to look at some of the data for unmet need for family planning among adolescents, um, which is defined as the proportion of adolescents age 15 to 19 who are married or in the union and who have an unmet need for family planning, meaning they do not want any more children or want to wait at least two years before having a baby, but are not using contraception. Um, and data collated by the Guttmacher Institute shows that there's a massive unmet need for family planning, including modern contraception among 
adolescent um, females. So out of 32 million adolescent women in uh, low and middle income countries who want to avoid a pregnancy, 14 million, 43% have an unmet need for modern contraception. And that is they want to avoid a pregnancy but are not using a modern method. Guttmacher also reports that 85% of adolescent women in low and middle income countries with an unmet need for modern contraception are using no contraceptive method at all, while the rest, 15%, are, uh, rely on traditional methods such as withdrawal. For many ad adolescent girls and young women, there are serious physical consequences of unintended pregnancies, of course. Um, for some, this includes unsafe abortion, and for others, early childbearing, both of which carry significant physical risks. Um, pregnancy and childbirth in adolescents are among the leading causes of death um, in adolescent females. And there can also be critical social and economic consequences, including negative impact on the likelihood of school completion and work-related opportunities. Um, many of the factors associated with adolescents' unmet need for family planning have been mentioned before uh, when this, in the, the previous slide that highlighted factors related to unintended pregnancy. Um, including, among other things, gender norms and unequal power in relationships. Um, so power imbalances and decision making within relationships, including relationships of married or unmarried adolescent girls and young women to older male partners or even same age male partners can be barriers um, to family planning use. More specifically, some adolescent girls and young women experience limited autonomy in uh, decisions about sex in general, including uh, with whom, when, where, how, um, and may experience coercive sex, um, as well as limited autonomy and decisions about family planning needs. And in many contexts across all ages, but perhaps especially for adolescents uh, and youth, um, decision making about contraceptive use within marriages often lies with uh, men, their husbands, and in some contexts also uh, in-laws. Um, stigma and taboos um, are also um, in many contexts um, a major barrier. There are in, in some um, settings strong taboos around talking about the human reproductive system and sex in general, which contributes to limited information uh, geared toward adolescents about contraception. There's also stigma, again, tied to gender norms about what is a socially acceptable behavior for adolescents that undermines their access to information and services. This often takes the form of family, community, and sometimes also health worker, social disapproval of adolescents. Um, again, especially unmarried female adolescents having sex at all um, and therefore having need for contraception. Um, when there's limited access to accurate age, appro age appropriate information, uh, myths and misconceptions about contraception can flourish uh, based on misunderstanding details of human reproductive functions and how contraception actually works. Um, many female adolescents have knowledge gaps and misconceptions about menstruation that cause fear and anxiety and leave them unprepared uh, when they start menstruating. Um, many males also have knowledge gaps about human fertility and family planning methods. Um, in a research review by Muna Kampe, Zulu, and Michelo of 21 studies highlighting adolescents' knowledge of contraception and abortion in low and middle income countries, noted that uh, across these 21 studies, adolescents had poor, limited, incomplete, and sometimes wrong knowledge and information about contraception and abortion. They also had poor sexuality or sexual reproductive health information, uh, in particular about how conception occurs, and this caused misconceptions or incorrect uh, information regarding contraception. They could also, um, they, they also could not effectively adopt safer pregnancy prevention strategies and other good reproductive health practice due to that low knowledge. Um, and this brings us to access to comprehensive sexuality education. Um, so because of these factors, many adolescents, both male and female, lack information they need to manage um, their sexual and reproductive lives. 
Um, this is one of the fundamental challenges. And although there have been advances over the years in the legal and policy frameworks that promote adolescent rights to comprehensive sexual education, translating this into quality program and tan quality programming and tangible results in terms of knowledge improvement and the ability to act on that knowledge remains a significant work in progress. So um, as I said initially, I think the numbers speak for themselves. Um, these and other data points clearly highlight the urgency of meeting the family planning needs of youth. I'm speaking of the health imperative and a rights imperative for all youth, regardless of where they come from, their socioeconomic background, gender identity or expression or other factors or other characteristics, we have very little information on the additional barriers that gender nonconforming adolescents in low and middle income countries face on accessing family uh, planning services, but these are likely to be even greater. Um, responding to the health rights imperative for youth today also contributes to the future health of families, communities, and societies in terms of overall health and economic progress. Um, and there's been progress as we've seen with some of the data, but um, glo the global youth population is obviously large and the needs in absolute numbers are going to continue to grow. So I think as we hear about youth defined priorities and demand for family planning, um, the question that we, some of the questions we need to be asking now are, um, how do we understand the true impact of these gaps? Um, the numbers are one thing, but um, what does that look like um, in the lives of youth and, um, why do these challenges persist? Many of these challenges are not new, especially around myths and misconceptions related to um, contraception. We know that some of the, some of the same myths um, that persist today about how contraception works or doesn't work um, have been uh, noted in various uh, communities and contexts for decades now. So why, why has it been so difficult to, to um, address this and how do we how do we uh, make improvements for um, for youth and for for all uh, individuals and couples? Um, and most importantly, how do we move forward? Um, how do we collectively define a vision that will really work? Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this from today's um, highly accomplished speakers and who are so well placed to lead the discussion. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That really, I think, helps us frame the conversation. Obviously, globally, there are so many challenges as it relates to sexual and reproductive health and, access, um, and rights and access to services. Um, so agreed. Very much looking forward to hearing from our speakers around um, the areas and challenges that they face. And for the audience, too, we're going to walk through some questions and um, have this conversation, but we'll leave time at the end for Q&A. I know that the event organizers put a note in the chat, but please feel free to drop any questions that you have from our conversation there, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. Um, so now I'm really excited to welcome Saba Khadija and Damilola. Um, just with quick introductions, uh, first Khadija Moore, she's an advocate for sexual and reproductive health and rights, specifically around gender equality and gender-based violence. She also recently graduated when she was studying political science and gender studies. So congratulations, Kadita. Um, but over the last 10 years, she's been really involved in government and also health education on her home island of Dominica. So I'm really excited for everyone to hear more about her experiences there. Next, we have Damilola Samuel. Damilola is a social entrepreneur and feminist from Nigeria. And he has spent the past six years working to improve availability of feminine hygiene projects um, and information related to feminine hygiene among schoolgirls and um, through his company, Green Tide Concepts. And then last, we have Saba Hussein. Saba is a first generation Pakistani American who's very passionate about the right for all women to own their own decisions about their reproductive health. And she's deeply involved in various initiatives at Pathfinder International, including by serving as a member for Pathfinder's President's Council. And she's also a founding member of Pathfinder's Next Gen Community, the Acacia Circle. So Saba, Khadija, and Damilola, welcome. I would love for you to each share a little bit more about what sparked your decision um, and your interest to get more involved in the sexual and reproductive health um, and rights. 
maybe starting with Saba, would you like to jump in and, and share more about really what got you involved? Sure. Thanks, Shailen. Um, as Shailen mentioned, I'm first generation Pakistani American. So, you know, being born in America, visiting Pakistan since childhood, there was always this, this constant counter perspective that I had. Um, and as I got older, I really noticed the discrepancy between my access to health services, to products, to information, um, in comparison to women who were just like me, just living in a different environment. Um, and I learned about Pathfinder through Lois Quam right shortly after she joined the organization and learned about their incredible work, not only in Pakistan, but in over 20 other countries with similar challenges that are affecting women and girls. And it really opened the door for me to this community where I could channel my own experiences and work to eliminate the discrepancy that I've seen. Wonderful, thanks Saba. Um, maybe Damilola, do you wanna jump in next? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name is Damilola once again. I started my starting up my career as an agripreneur. I noticed a pattern among rural school girls as in they, do, they used to miss classes for about three to five class every month. And due to number of absenteeism in school, they do, they do drop out of school. And sometimes most of them, they get impregnated by one roadside mechanic or poor farmer child like them. So this makes rural girls to continue in the same level of poverty with their parents. And fortunately for me, on a faithful day like that, I was able to board a decent boss with one of the community teachers. I challenged that why is that your girls are most time out of school. So he explained to me, she explained to me that these girls miss school every month due to their lack of access to sanitary pad. And I was like, this is serious. We have to provide, we have to create a solution to this. We have to ensure that girls are kept in school to have equal access to education as boys so that this will help them to reach the peak of their career. And that's how it all started. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. So um, basically, my story is kind of similar to Saba's, where um, she mentioned access to information and to products and services relating to sexual and reproductive health and rights. So um, I'm from a small island, and it's predominantly Catholic. So there are a lot of um, taboos surrounding sex and sexuality. Um, so while I was in high school, I noticed that they were only teaching us like an abstinence-based approach to sex. You know, they only taught us the biological aspects. They didn't teach us anything about relationships mm -hmm. or consent, um, LGBT, um, Q plus um, things. You know, they didn't teach us any of that. Um, it was just like abstinence-based and it wasn't really anything that could help us, you know, they, they didn't provide any tools for us. So um, I got involved in the family planning movement and the IPPF, just because of that, I wanted to have more information. I wanted more information to be provided to young girls and young boys about their um, sexual experience, their sexual health experience. Um, so because of the taboos and the stigma that came along with this, um, this small island mentality, um, I decided to join the Planned Parenthood so I could basically help more young people get the tools that they need to be equipped so they could live their lives in a better way, basically. Thank you. No, that was a great segue to Khadija, because I would love to hear more, um, maybe from um, Saba and Damalola too, about what that process was like getting involved. And Khadija, if you have more to add too. So you've been able to identify these different challenges and then you started to take action. I would love to hear more about what that process was like and how you got involved and what you've been able, maybe like specific skills or a deeper understanding what you've been able to gain from that too. So can I jump in? Of course. Yeah, thank you so much. So like the project I said, uh, starting up as an agripreneur, I noticed this pattern that most times girls do miss school for about three to five days every month. And I didn't know this, I didn't know this actually from the inception until I met one of the teacher I challenged and she explained to me that the problem is, is much more than just missing classes. 
it as far as causing these girls dropping out of school, causing these girls, it, they, they use unhygienic materials during their menstrual period. That is why they try to avoid embarrassment in school, and that is why they try to stay at home for about three to five classes. And as a result of absenteeism, it causes them to repeat classes, to lag behind their peers. Not just that, these girls, they have other, they, they have op options. And we have to like encourage these girls to overcome the, their, their hurdles. What actually happened is I have to look for a means to start this project. And I, I, the idea was not fully shaped. I started by um, raising funds locally from my personal polls and uh, friends and family to buy sanitary pad for this girl. But trust me, it wasn't sustainable. And that's how I discover how to manufacture sanitary pad from planting and banana stem fiber. And that's how it all started. I have to partner with school teachers because as being a man, it was challenging. They don't allow me to speak on feminine hygiene. And trust me, feminine uh, menstruation is a taboo in most communities. So they don't teach menstruation in school. They don't teach feminine reproductive system in school. And most parents, they don't teach their children. So these girls don't just find themselves menstruating. They don't know how to get, they don't know how to go about it. And that's how the idea of sensitization comes in. So we have to go to school, we educate these girls on proper feminine hygiene, on menstruation, on reproductive health, and we let them know how uh, the, uh, the whole hygienic alternative, the practice, how it could damage their reproductive system and how this could cause harm to their health as well. So we let all this clear to them and we partner with teachers, school teachers, we partner with community uh, school uh, authority, we partner with community elders and parishes, church parishes. So we go out, we do this everywhere. And as to, to, to make this more effective, we introduce our biodegradable sanitary parts to them, which is the product we produce green part. We share for free, we partner with organizations that have funding to push this sanitary part for free to the girls. And that is what we do from here in Nigeria, green part concepts. Thank you. I can jump in next. Thanks, Demula. Um, so just in the formal way that I feel that I got involved was with Pathfinder. I think that's been the, the most accelerated channel for me to take action. Um, I do think a lot of the experience that I've had has related to just starting the conversations with not only, you know, my sibling, my parents, my family, the diaspora in America, you know, just other um, friends and family that have similar experiences being first generation. So really learning about, you know, what my mom's experience was with family planning to, you know, my sister, and then also speaking with cousins that are back in Pakistan. Um, and I think that that, like you said, Danula, the stigma also became very apparent to me because even with my family or friends, I felt this innate kind of uncomfortableness when speaking about it, even in a, in a very informal way. So um, that brought to light a lot of the ways that I hadn't really been aware of my experience being a bit more privileged. Um, and I think that even with events that we've had and, and trying to engage with the Pakistani diaspora, um, you know, there's, it's, there's an emphasis on using the right vernacular as to not you know, deter people from being un or having them feel uncomfortable in the same way that the stigma obviously makes people feel. So um, that, that's been a learning process for me. I would say I'm just at the beginning. I, I, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in how I've broken into um, getting involved, but, but it has been a journey so far. Thank you, Saba. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the island is predominantly Catholic. So um, most of the opposition comes from schools and also parents who feel that teachers or sexual health educators don't have a right to teach their child about sex. They think it should be like their job, but they don't actually do it because they too receive little to no information about sex and um, sex, their sexual health, um, any sexual health information. And that is because it's basically a culture of silence. And we basically live in a, a society that tells you don't speak about sex because it's 
it's an action between a cis man and his cis wife, you know? Um, they don't teach you anything else because they don't know sometimes or they just feel too uncomfortable to share. Um, so most of the parents too had to experiment to learn. So they, they have no idea what they're telling their kids if they ever do, you know? And this is something that we're trying to eliminate with the Planned Parenthood organizations. Um, and that's why we go into the schools and we teach basically comprehensive sexuality education. So we would do it in an age appropriate manner. If we're, into, if we're going into preschools and kindergarten, we teach them about good touches and bad touches. We teach um, like elementary school level kids um, how to say no. We teach them what consent is. Um, and the older they get, the more information becomes available to them. Um, I remember once, um, I went into the family planning clinic and by the time I got home, someone had called my mother and told her, um, I saw your daughter at the family planning clinic and they were concerned and they were concerned because they were worried that I was basically taking care of myself. And I think they should have been cheering me on or applauding my efforts as a young person, you know, trying to receive the information, trying to receive products. And my mom had no problem with me being there because I was a part of the youth group. I served on the board of directors. So she knew what I was doing. She knew what I was up to. I was, I was basically seeking information, trying to educate other young people. And it just, it was amazing to, um, to hear the person who said it, you know, um, your daughter is over there and they're like kind of scared and kind of worried that I'm there, but they should have been applauding my efforts, you know? Um, so we just know that a lot, of the, a lot of the barriers come from the taboos and the stigma that's related to sex and sexual health. Um, so that's what we've been trying to do, like basically crush the, um, the barriers, break down the opposition. We also have like opposition from the government and it's just, it's a lot, but as advocates, you have to um, push um, and you have to push hard. So that's basically what I've been trying to do these last 10 years, just push hard and, and fight hard so that we can have better access to information and products and services relating to family planning. Yeah, it definitely sounds like just the topic ex itself and how taboo it is and un uncomfortable it is to talk about with um, so many different people is really one of the biggest challenges. And I'm also curious in your experiences if there have been key individuals or stakeholders that have helped you overcome that challenge or organizations that you really are thankful for their role that they've been able to play to help you overcome that taboo topic and really thrive in, in the work that you've been able to do. Yeah, I could go ahead. Um, so yeah, definitely Pathfinder <laughs> for me. Um, I had the privilege of working with the um, country director in Pakistan actually, and hearing from a, she, she was born in Pakistan and works in the community with Pathfinder. Um, and so hearing a, a different view into the work that's being done from her perspective, as opposed to me being first generation and, and someone who comes and goes and visits and isn't living it um, was really eye-opening. I think that it provided a, me with a lot of tools to be able to promote and, and engage in advocacy here um, in America and engaging with the diaspora here. So um, Pathfinder being my one tool is definitely, definitely the one answer for me. Yeah, thank you. So what we do is um, we partner with school teachers and um, community leaders. We partner with um, women-led organizations and how we're able to reach out to women and girls, especially when we talk about school girls, we're able to partner with teachers because that's the only edge we have to reach out to these girls. If we are to be talking to them one by one, it won't be effective. But we reach out to them hundreds in schools. We reach out to them in hundreds in number in schools on assembly ground. We educate them on proper feminine hygiene, on reproductive 
collective health on how they can on sex education. It has really helped and we're able to partner with other organizations that have networks of women. So this helps us to educate them and we provide them with relevant information needed. Not just that, we as well recommend um, near fire health facilities to them where they could easily um, go for medical checkup, where if they have an infection, where they could easily get treatment, proper treatment. So we recommend our health um, practitioners to them. But also we go to churches, we go to mosques and uh, religious bodies. So they open the floor to us. So after the service, they let the women wait. So we educate them. We let them know effect of all these things. And as well, not just the women, as they are girls. So this is how we have been able to have an help to reach out to the right audience. Thank you. I've also had the opportunity to um, work alongside with and under um, numerous organizations that have helped um, both me personally and um, people in my country. So um, apart from the Dominica Planned Parenthood Association and the Caribbean Family Planning Affiliation, which are both located in the Caribbean, um, the International Planned Parenthood Federation also provides us with tools. Um, Women Deliver also um, provides us with tools, you know, um, over the last four to five years, I've received um, dozens of training opportunities. I've been to conferences that basically equipped me to um, with the tools to go back home and help um, many local organizations too. I have to um, say many thanks to them because um, the Cancer Society, the women, um, the Women's Bureau, you know, the Bureau of Gender Affairs, um, basically also um, pharmacies back home, they also play a big role. They do a lot to help us in whatever ways possible, um, be it with transportation, um, items for like food, food stuff during um, poster campaigns where we go into communities. We do health clinics with um, various health centers across the island. Um, just to get the information out. So it's um, it's really good, all the energy that comes from just local organizations and other stakeholders back home. Um, I have to give them basically a huge thank you for all the help they've um, provided, um, not only myself and Levy Dominic or the Planned Parenthood with, but basically all the young people in Dominica who have these tools now to better help themselves. Thank you. You know, all three of you have had such different journeys and um, experiences in your own education process and advocacy process and small business process. And I'm also curious if there are key, there were key moments throughout your journey that have been really motivating for you and have really kept you going, whether it's a key milestone that you've reached or a success or even an obstacle, because I'm sure Sometimes it can get tiring to not see results as quickly as you want to, or to continue that energy and keep things moving. Um, so I would love to hear if there have been those key moments that have, have really kept you motivated and determined in this space. Okay, I'll just start off. Um, as we all know, advocacy can be really draining. And when you're in this for um, such a long time, you feel, um, really overwhelmed, especially with all the stories that you hear. In 2016, when um, my co-founder and I launched it, Levy Dominique, um, we did so to empower, empower people to speak up. Like I said, it's um, these issues get swept under the rug, domestic violence issues, intimate partner violence, um, anything related to family violence, it's, it's kept to um, basically a minimum, you know, you don't hear, much or there's outrage for two days and then everybody forgets about the issue after. Um, what we did with Levy Dominique was it went from a social media campaign to a full-fledged organization. Um, so currently um, we don't only wanna help people through basically one way. We wanna help them um, in multiple ways. 
So the survivors of gender-based violence, the survivors of street harassment, abuse, um, molestation, we try to turn them into advocates or help them receive counseling. Um, we also did yoga sessions a lot because that helped, you know? Um, so we don't only try to help them by letting them speak up because they're gonna ask what's next. Okay, I've, I've, I've shared my story, but what, am I, what can I do next? You know, so they also wanna help other survivors who are too shy or too timid to talk, who are too scared to speak about their experiences. Um, so we took a step back and we decided that we're not just only gonna have this for like one or two days or one or two weeks. Um, so the following year in 2017, we did a women's march um, and we marched through this, the capital city. Um, and I think that was a defining moment in my advocacy because you saw everyone coming together, younger people, older people, men and women alike, children, everyone from all walks of life, just coming up to us, getting their t-shirts, walking around with their purple balloon. It was, um, it was a women's day march. So it was just very satisfying to see everyone who came out to support us and to support the survivors of, um, of these things that people don't wanna speak about. Um, so that was um, really gratifying to me. It was a satisfying moment and it really um, pushed me to continue what I was doing because a lot of times you feel like you wanna give up because change is limited or change doesn't come as soon as you want it to but you just have to work harder and push harder and keep doing things that motivate you and the people that you serve. I love that story. Could Thank you. you. About, um, about the Women's March when we were preparing for this too. That was such a standout to see how enthusiastic you were around that, but really how much energy that getting such a big group together and supporting each other around these issues and their experiences was. So thanks for sharing. Damilola, were you about to were you about to um, jump in? Thank you. I was um, about, to jump, about to jump in. So what I want to share actually is when I was um, <clears throat> when the dream, when the idea seems too big, when the uh, dream seems too big for me to achieve, because I have created a platform, a floor that enables the marginalized women and girls to see the idea I have. As a matter of fact, I have, I have created a network for the women to, to, to form a cooperative that will be extracting the fiber and they will be selling it back to the Green Part Concepts. So all these things have been put in place, but there was no funding as such coming in to kickstart the idea. Then it seems too big. Even people around feel I can't achieve the goal, I can't achieve the dream. But fortunately enough for me, I was able to raise some little capital to kickstart it and gradually it was moving. So it's highly impressive, it's highly encouraging. And most times when we, in the lives we impact, whenever we are talking to the women, whenever we are paying the women from the fibers, they extract, they sell to Green Park, all these things, they are the ones that give joy to me to keep on pushing the dream. These are the things that keeps the motivation. They are the, they, they, they are the, they, they are the fuel that keep propelling the force because when we see the lives, when they give, when, when they give their feedback, their word of thanks to us, all these things, they are the, they, they are the propeller that keep us moving. Thank you. Those are great stories. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, I, I think my, Motivation has been more of the obstacle route. Um, you know, my timeline of learning about health service had, has been pretty privileged. I understood it as my right. And with the last administration's impact hitting me personally, I think that very much underscored that it's, it's not something that's seen as a right even here. Um, so a lot of the focus that I had was, you know, places that were more developing, that needed more assistance, more education, they were relatively, you know, not as progressive. Um, to see those impacts be happening, you know, with the Global Her Act and, and some pretty incredible um, laws come into place that impact us in 20, 
20, 2021 were, were very much my motivation to keep fighting. This is not something that we can rest on our laurels about. It's not something that anybody is immune from. It affects everybody. And unfortunately, we're not in a place where it is a right for everyone. Um, and so it's just realizing how much further behind we are than I originally had understood has been my motivation to keep going. Have in all of this different advocacy work that you've all three of you have really done in different ways. Have you identified that there are particular ways that you as individuals, or maybe even using your affiliation with your like green pad concepts, for example, Donna Lola, or with Planned Parenthood or with Pathfinder, where your advocacy is really able to be the most effective, where you as an individual are able to generate that momentum in the advocacy space for access to services and for sexual and reproductive health rights. Thank you. The advocacy, actually, when I first started the advocacy program, I <laughs> that it was really challenging because I was rejected in schools. The, what the challenge, what actually, what they say is, you are a boy, you are a man. What is your problem with this menstruation, feminine hygiene issue? So I was frustrated. I was, I felt bad because. I wish I keep on pushing these. I wish I educated the girls. And there was no way forward until I spoke with my mentor, a mentor of mine in Kenya. So she explained to me that in a situation like this, as a man, you have to bring a lady, you, and you need to have partners, a lady that will open the floor for you. And honestly, it really works. Then I have two partners, the two of them are female. So what they do is they are the one that address the school authority, they submit the proposal, they open the floor, then they bring me on board. And that is how it all started. It was like magic, seriously. It was really challenging initially, but now it's really encouraging. And the most good part of it is that these women, they are even now doing much better than I myself. They are highly more fantastic. You know, it's most of their things. So they know the loop and corners to, to mention so they do it better and we all do it collectively and we are achieving great results. We have a network of women and ladies, both River State and Ondo State that do this advocacy for women and girls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna Lola, for sharing. Um, and I think then too, so now as we're thinking about our friends and others that we wanna get involved in our work um, or spread more awareness around or ensure that they're getting the education they need, I would also love for you all to share a piece of advice that you have for one of your peers that's also trying to get more information or trying to develop new interventions um, so that their peers have access to services or drive those advocacy efforts. A tip or a piece of advice that you might give them. Yeah, I could, uh, I can jump in really quick. Uh, one of the things that I've found in just speaking with, um, you know, family members and, and friends being you know, when talking about this is that there's a lot of well-intentioned, well intentions when it comes to wanting to help, especially from external sources, you know, NGOs and, and foundations. One of the, you know, obviously as everyone has mentioned, it doesn't matter how medically objective and correct information can be. There's so much of an armor around it that comes in the form of culture and stigma. And I think the, the most effective places that I have seen the advocacy and that breakthrough happen is when those conversations are had by um, individuals that they can identify with. So in, in the case of the country director in Pakistan, her being from the community and being the person to have those conversations, I think is very important. It's not something that, uh, it's not something that's spoken, but it's, it makes the difference from my, from my um, perspective on being able to reach any type of, um, or break down any barrier, but also to reach people with the information that you have. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, let me join, jump in quickly. <laughs> go so, ahead. Oh, Khadija, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, my advice to young people is to never give up. Even when you are faced with opposition, even when you are faced with barriers, you go out there and you get the information yourself and you push for other young people to get access as well. Um, it is not just a you problem, it is a global issue. You know, it's not just the youth of your country, it's the youth of hundreds of other countries, you know, that are faced with um, similar situations. And everyone's situation is unique. So you basically have to advocate for what you want, um, which is why I stress that um, meaningful youth engagement is as important as anything else. Um, giving giving um, young people a seat or access to a seat at the table is imperative. If there's no seat, you create one or you create your own table, but you do what you need to do to get the information that you need to help yourself and to help others like you. That's my advice. Damilola, are you still connected and able to jump in on that too? May have frozen for a second, but that's okay. Um, so then also thinking more broadly um, about these organizations that are have been able to provide this support for you or institutions or governments um, that are working on these issues at that higher level. Um, Khadija, I think you've touched on it a bit about that meaningful youth engagement, but I would love to hear if there is also something that you really wish that these, um, that these broader institutions keep in mind to help advance these efforts globally. Um, well, that is exactly what I want them to keep in mind. Um, I remember when um, many of our organizations decided that they were gonna have at least two board members who are below the age of 25 serve on their boards. Um, I think it's important that we not only give this, um, the youth a seat at the table, but we also engage them. You know, you ask them what are their wants and their needs. And like I said, everyone's situation is unique. Everybody's different. Everybody has different needs and wants. But um, as young people, it's all interconnected. Um, so giving two or more people a seat at the table helps chart a path forward for your organization or for your government or for your country because you have um, versatility, you have, um, you have the differences that you're gonna need to make um, for um, young people to have like better access um, and the difference is they knowing what they want and they knowing what they need. And it's unique to what older people will want. You know, um, the next generation has a voice. So why not allow them to use that voice to help themselves and the people who are coming after them? Thank you. Thank you so much, Khadija. I encourage women and girls to persist even during the challenging period for their own betterment. And uh, I will encourage women to ensure they give their best to themselves to, and as well, whatever resources you know you can use to support fellow women and girls in Lonnie Bowl, try as much as possible to give it to them. We are all trying to get our best. Every women have this um, need, every girl so have this need to educate every girl around us. Let's try our best to give our best to uh, every woman around us and women of uh, feminine hygiene for the good of all, both male and female. So there is no limitation anywhere, and if there are men in
we may have lost him for a second again, but I don't know, Saba speaking to like those, the, the call to action then for these other supporting actions or organizations and institutions and governments. I don't know if you wanted to add anything around that too. Yeah, I think what I originally said definitely could also <laughs> apply here, but to Khadija's point and, you know, to platforms like this is, is just a great example of being able to have our voices heard. I don't think that's something that uh, we're used to yet, but I love that there is such an emphasis around it. And even in the comments, there's so much support. So I would highly encourage that partnership to continue and to, to constantly have that diversity also in, in the room and conversations when, when talking about what's next. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much for sharing more about your story um, and your experience as well as advice that you have for our peers in this space. I think this definitely is something that um, the conversation is really just getting started. There's so much more that we can be doing together, especially in that collaborative way. Um, so now I'd love to jump into our Q&A from the audience around um, some of the stories that you shared. Um, we have one question that's specifically related to COVID and if it's affected your work at all, and if so, how and how have you been able to overcome any of those challenges? Go ahead, Khadija, so, I can, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so COVID, um, it put us in a, in a um, very precarious situation. Um, where it hasn't been easy to do everything that we used to do before. Um, our poster campaigns are going into schools because um, for much of 2020, um, our countries are on lockdown. And um, while I commend the government for doing their part to stop the spread, because even in Dominica, um, there are very, there are low number of cases. Right now, we, we maybe have like, two to four active um, cases in the country. Um, so I commend them for that. Um, but um, COVID has slowed the process of advocacy. It has also um, basically, I think advocates have, were already tired and drained and overwhelmed with all their work and COVID made it harder for them to do that work. So a lot of people have taken a step back or put um, their plans and their um, ideas on a back burner because of COVID. Um, so it has slowed our, our progress and it has slowed our work. Um, but right now we are figuring out creative ways to you know, get back on the road, get back on the streets, get back into the schools. Um, the vaccine, the vaccine program rolled out in um, my country. So a lot of people are getting vaccinated. So that's a good thing. Um, so it'll be much easier for us to get into the schools, especially um, for the new school year, because between 2020 and 2021, we have basically taken a nosedive in our, in our um, endeavors to um, get people the help that they need. Um, so hopefully it'll get better for the 2021-2020 um, academic school year. Uh, so I have a two-part answer, one being the, the challenge, obviously, that has come. I think the conversation around women's health and rights is already a fight to get into conversation without a global pandemic. And, you know, with the pandemic, it's just been that much harder to keep it top of mind and to keep it something that is focused on and, and something that is um, a priority. So that has definitely been a challenge to, um, you know, try and navigate the conversation and really to remind people that it's all interrelated. COVID has affected women in developing countries far vastly. It's, it's you know, it's undeniable in, from that perspective, but having to frame it in that way has been a bit of a challenge. Um, and then the other part of it that I have seen is, is kind of a light, particularly for Pathfinder in their operating model being that they operate and have, they work in countries with members of that community. So there weren't actually, there wasn't a lot of, you know, people leaving and having to come back because of COVID. The actual um, employees were in, living in those communities and didn't have to kind of leave, um, 
which I thought was just an incredible, you know, owed to their operating model one and of itself, but also the ingenuity that has come out of how they have been able to pivot around the constraints around COVID um, in, in all of the different countries and, and just seeing how the relentlessness of the of the people who are working there to to not quit like Khadija was saying you know it's it's very exhausting it's very tiring so to have people still want to find a new answer or find a new way is is really inspiring yeah definitely that piece around keeping the energy and, and staying motivated but then also being so adaptable um I would imagine it sounds like is um definitely what's been core to that. Um, I also have a question here. Um, if there's a way for audience members to follow the work that you're doing. I know it looks like Dami Lola had, been, had hopped off. So I'll put a note for his organization in the chat too. But if there's more um, from either Khadija or Saba around how audience members can follow the work that you're doing, um, and find opportunities to invest in the work that you're doing too, that would be great to share. Okay, um, we have a Facebook page. Um, it's Levy Dominique, and I'm gonna type it up in the chat so you could see it. Um, so you could just find us on Facebook, Levy Dominique. Um, also for Pathfinder and for the next generation leaders in Pathfinder and the Acacia Circle, we also do have social media, um, we have Instagram as well. So I am happy to share that to anyone who would like to follow or to get involved also. Awesome. And is there any additional, are there any other questions for the audience? Before I then close it out and hand it over to Matthew. If not, thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, thank you, Damalola, Khadija, and Saba for sharing more about your story and your experiences here. This was really a wonderful conversation and I'm so happy to be connected to all three of you. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Matthew. Great, hey, thank you, uh, Shaylin and um, everyone, Khadija, Saba, and uh, Dami Lola, unfortunately we had to drop off. Um, fantastic uh, forum uh, conversation. You see there's a survey that's dropped in the chat box, so I'd appreciate if uh, folks could, could fill that out before you uh, hop off. Um, for me, these, these, these stories are inspiring. Um, keep fighting for you know, sexual reproductive health, family planning, education services, transparency of information, breaking down sociocultural norms and barriers. So young women, so and men can take the right decisions for themselves and their bodies. And, and you know, what can we do is some of the questions were put out there to, to help support these uh, brave, I would say really brave, courageous, um, passionate, smart, creative young people in, um, in the work they're doing. So um, I want to thank also everyone who's joined us, um, fellow co-chairs, as um, Lara mentioned at the beginning, Lara Ho and Stephanie Vasquez from our health and nutrition um, work, work group, and then um, Christy Olenek and myself are on the youth and development work group. If you have any ideas for future uh, work group events, the youth or the health and nutrition, feel free to reach out. Uh, the youth and development work group uh, is, is exploring a systems related fun, um, activity event where we have uh, industry, government, young people and um, civil society organizations and how they are being responsive or can be more responsive to young people's needs. So there's keep a lookout over the coming uh, weeks and months for, for that. Um, so that that is it. I really just want to thank uh, thank all of you for for this. And that it takes time out of your day. You're busy. Congratulations again, Khadija, on your recent graduation. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we'll close and enjoy the rest of your week, everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.